women. One of the th things that uh, the Quran is being accused of in modern times is being anti-women. And the implication seems to be that, look, we have another book, the Bible, which is actually very good for women, and so we should reject the Quran and choose the Bible. Actually, my experience is quite the opposite. If one were to look, for example, at the story of uh, Eve, uh, in the Quran and in the Bible, one will see that in the Quran, Eve is not blamed anywhere for the sin of Adam. In fact, Adam is specifically blamed. And they are both said to have been, in a way, uh, uh, deceived by the devil. They're, they're, they're caused to, rather not, not both deceive, the devil caused both of them to slip from the garden in which they had their security. Uh, but the one who is singled out for blame in the Quran is Adam. In chapter 20, verse number 119-120, it says, فَعَصَى Adam رَبَّهُ Adam disobeyed his Lord. Of course, the story in the Quran is not one about original sin, but about original forgiveness, about an original lesson. The Quranic story tells us basically that when you sin, if you turn back to God, God will forgive you as he forgave our first parents. But in the Bible, of course, we know from Genesis chapter 3 that the woman was blamed. And Adam's fault was that he listened to his wife and took the fruit and ate it from her. And that is followed through in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses number 3 to 10. Uh, so let, let me start with verse number 11. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. But I do not allow a woman to teach or... Exp actually, I've, hold on, I've mixed up my quotes here. So, uh, this is actually 1 Timothy Chapter 2, verse 11. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman, being deceived, fell into transgression. But women will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with uh, self-restraint. 1 Timothy chapter 2, uh, verses number 11, uh, forward. Um, I find that text a little bit puzzling because I thought the, the general plan was that everybody gets saved by the, the fact that Jesus died for our sins. It seems that this passage is pointing out that women have a very different plan of salvation. Women will be saved through childbearing. But what is e equally uh, troubling is uh, the, the idea that the man was not deceived, it was the woman who was deceived. And when we think back about the Samson story, it was Delilah who betrays him. And one, when one thinks back about all of the stories in the Bible, one finds that Sarah and Delilah, and it looks like women are always being painted in a bad light in the Bible, or we should we say mostly painted in a bad light. And we must ask why this is so. But I, I found it uh, uh, equally disturbing that uh, Dave actually cited this passage with great ease. He has no problem with saying that it wasn't the man who was deceived, it was the woman who was deceived. And of course, women have been blamed for all of the ills uh, of uh, men. Somebody said that's why they are called uh, women, you know, woe, woe to men. Anyway, that's... Uh, <laughs> Now, what is the reason for the women's covering? In, in the Islamic faith, the Quran says that uh, the women uh, should uh, draw a, a part of their outer garments over themselves. That's in chapter 33 of the Quran. So that they should be known and, and not molested. It seems that from, from the context of that passage, there were hypocrites in Medina, the city of the Prophet, who were harassing the women. And when they were asked about that, they were giving some excuses. They were saying, we didn't know these were our women and so on. So the Quran was just simply advising the women that if they were to uh, gather the garments in a particular way, they would be recognized in that society as decent, upright women ones who would not mess around, and that would rob the hypocrites of the one excuse which they had. On the other hand, the Quran promised the hypocrites, or rather threatened them, that if they do not st stop their ill behavior, they will be driven out from the area. So the purpose of the woman's head covering seems to be then, that she guards herself from being molested by people who might be looking out for uh, a quick uh, encounter. What is the purpose in the Bible then for a head cover? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse numbers 10 to, uh, verses number 3 to 10. That's where I began, and here are the verses now. Paul writes and says, But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every woman, and the man is the head of a woman, 
And God is the head of Christ. Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. But every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head. For she is one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to have his head covered since he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of man. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed, man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. Therefore, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. So, you can see the symbolism and imagery here. A woman must have a sign of authority on her head. A woman wearing her headscarf following this passage should be doing so to show that she is subordinate. Somebody is above her. Uh, the, the man is above her. And of course, above the man is Christ. So there's a hierarchy of beings, and the woman is actually way down below. You have God and Christ and man and then woman. So it's a different sort of imagery here. If one says that the Quran demeans women and the Bible praises uh, women or puts them in a much better light, uh, I think one has to think again because the reality is actually the opposite if one were to really be familiar with most scriptures. Of course, we're not so familiar with these scriptures because who bothers anymore? Most of us have the better sense to realize that Paul here is writing at a time when he could think in this way. And we don't think in that way anymore. Again, we think that's the Bible, that's what it said at one time, but God has given us intelligence to think, to reason, and uh, we are informed both by the reason and the scripture. Now, it turns out that uh, according to the Bible, a man could sell his daughter as a slave. Exodus chapter 21 verse number 7 says, If a man sells his daughter as a female slave, she is not to go free as the male slaves do. I don't have time to elaborate on that, but I think that's enough. Now, there is a way that uh, a man might be required to prove that his daughter was a virgin at the time when she got married. Deuteronomy chapter 22 verses number 15 and forward. Recently, we got all hyped up about the Aksa Parve's uh, murder, and we're wondering, what does that have to do with Islam? And some people are thinking, well, yeah, that's Islam's teaching. You know, honor killings all over the Muslim world. What are Muslims doing? They're following the Quran. They're not following the Quran. The Quran, in fact, prohibits Muslims from taking innocent life. And uh, taking a life for what people call honor killing is actually a dishonorable murder, for as far as uh, I can understand from the Quran. But we can see that uh, in the Bible, there is some hint of... Uh, Something that we might call honor killing. Just listen. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses number 15 forward. Then the girl's father and her mother shall take and bring out the evidence of the girl's virginity to the elders of the city at the gate. I should preface that by saying, that's in case her husband says, when I married her, she wasn't a virgin. The girl's father shall say to the elders, so apparently the father saves uh, some of her garments from the wedding night, uh, perhaps stained with uh, uh, material that will show that she was a virgin at the time. So now he parades it before the elders of the city to prove that his daughter was a virgin. The girl's father shall say to the elders, I gave my daughter to this man for a wife, but he turned against her, and behold, he has charged her with shameful deeds, saying, I did not find your daughter a virgin, but this is the evidence of my daughter's virginity. Imagine how shameful that must be for the girl. And they said, they shall spread the garment before the elders of the city. So the elders of that city shall take the man and chastise him, and they shall fine him a hundred shekels of silver and give it to the girl's father, because he publicly defamed the virgin of Israel, and she shall remain his wife. He cannot divorce her all his, all his days. But if this charge is true, that the girl was not found a virgin, then they shall bring out the girl to the doorway of her father's house, and the men of her city shall stone her to death because she has committed an act of folly in Israel by playing the harlot in her father's house. Thus, you shall purge the evil from among you. You see, why she brought to her father's house to receive her death penalty? Because this is how you purge the evil. Because she has defiled her father's house and now the name of the family must be cleared. And the same thing goes, or slightly differently, for a priest's daughter. Leviticus chapter 21, verse number 9. Suppose a priest's daughter makes herself unclean by becoming a prostitute. Then she brings shame on her father. She must be burned to death. Why? You see what's happening? She brings shame to her father. You can understand that around the Mediterranean basin in ancient times, this was a very common way of viewing things. You bring shame to me, I uh, eradicate myself from that, uh, I eradicate that shame by putting an end to it in a very decisive way, 
a poor girl is, uh, is killed. Jephthah. Jephthah. I don't know how many of you know, know Jephthah. We didn't learn much about him in Sunday school. Uh, in Judges chapter 11, uh, then the Lord's Spirit took control of Jephthah, and Jephthah went through Gilead and Manasseh, raising an army. Finally, he arrived at Mizpah in Gilead, where he promised the Lord, If you let me defeat the Ammonites and come home safely, I will sacrifice to you whatever comes, or whoever, rather, whoever comes out to meet me first. Then eventually he gets home because he's destroyed all of these armies by the help of God. And when Jephthah returned to his home, this is verse number 34 in Mitzpah, the first one to meet him was his daughter. She was playing a tambourine and dancing to celebrate his victory, and she was his only child. Oh, Jephthah cried. Then he tore his clothes in sorrow and said to his daughter, I made a sacred promise to the Lord, and I must keep it. Your coming out to meet me has broken my heart. Father, she said, you made a sacred promise to the Lord, and he let you defeat the Ammonites. Now you must do what you promised, even if it means I must die. But first, let me spend two months wandering in the hill country with my friends. We'll cry together, because I can never get married and have children. Yes, you may have two months, Jephthah said. She and some other girls left, and for two months they wandered in the hill country crying because she could never get married and have children. Then she went back to her father. He did what he had promised, and she never got married. What a nice way of saying it. And she never got married. Of course she never got married. That's why every year, uh, Israelite girls walk around for four days weeping for Jephthah's daughter. So, we can see then that in, in short, there is something about honor killings actually in, in the Bible. Clearer than this is Deuteronomy chapter 13, which speaks about an apostate in your own house. If one of your family commits apostasy, what are you to do? You are to be the first ones to stone the apostate in your own family. So honor killings is very old. It predates the religion of Islam. It's not condoned by the Quran. But uh, we can see that in fact, uh, I don't know what they called it back then, but it looks like the th kinds of things I'm looking at in the Bible right now uh, is similar to what we are referring to as honor killings in our present time. So you see a lot of times people uh, misunderstand, they blame the Quran for something that it does not represent and Muslims of course might be better followers of the Bible than they are of the uh, of the Quran. But you know I, I don't want to commit any excesses here. I only prepared this to to meet uh, Dave on his own ground because I've read his books and I've seen the kinds of approaches that he takes. What is the punishment for rape? It is clear from the Quran that uh, uh, hiraba or highway robbery or attacking a person is punishable, but rape is not specifically mentioned in the Quran either. Either way, it's just not uh, mentioned. And one might see that uh, as, as a defect. One might say, okay, well, why doesn't it mention rape? It is a very common thing. I, I don't know why. This is the word of God, but Muslims uh, develop the Islamic law in, in ways that will try to enact justice. And, of course, we use our reason in addition to the scripture. Rape is wrong, we punish it. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses number 22 on forward, talks about what should happen in the case of rape. If a girl is attacked and uh, she is uh, not married, she is single, then uh, she, obviously she doesn't be belong to anyone. So the penalty is that uh, this uh, the attacker is to pay her father.